to Dialogue Across Difference, an event series hosted by the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance at the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Join us as Center Director Larry Jacobs and guests engage in conversations across the political and policy spectrum on issues of the day. Good afternoon, I'm Professor Larry Jacobs. I direct the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance at the University of Minnesota's Center for the Study of Politics and Governance. Before we begin, I wanna invite you to participate and you can do that by clicking the button at the bottom that says Q&A. We are eager to get your questions. Please send them and we're gonna to get to as many as possible. There's also live captioning. And if you like that, I believe it's in the chat function and you can go there as well if the button at the bottom doesn't work. Welcome and thank you for joining today's program, Latino voters in the 2022 elections. Our guest today is Mark Hugo Lopez. Mr. Lopez is director of the um, race and ethnicity research um, at Pew Research Center. Before that, Mr. Luke, excuse me, Mr. Lopez was research director at the Civic Learning and Engagement Circle. He has published many, many reports. He has his bachelor's degree from the University of California at Berkeley and a PhD in economics from Princeton. Mark Lopez, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Larry. It's really great to be here. And I'm looking forward to our conversation today. There's so much to talk about. So you and your colleagues at uh, the Pew Research Center recently came out with a report on Latino voters. Bring us up to date. What, what do you find is most relevant to the election that's that we're now in the middle of? The first is, I think, the issues that are most important to determining Latinos vote this year. And there's been a shift in that over the course of the last year. Um, the economy is a top issue. Eighty percent of Latino registered voters told us that is the issue that's going to determine their vote. But abortion rose as an issue from not really being relevant to now being in the top six or seven. So that's one key finding. A second key finding is the way that Latinos view the parties. If you've been following the conversation about Latino voters since 2020, there's been a conversation about Latinos turning Republican, leaning towards the Republican Party, uh, Donald Trump winning more than expected of Latino voter support. Um, our survey shows that Democrats continue to remain, um, uh, could retain a large advantage with Latinos, even if there has been some slippage uh, from where we had been in the past. But Latinos also see the Democrats as doing more than Republicans to reach out to Latinos. And they also, though, see hardly any difference between the parties. So it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but how they view the parties is the other big important finding. The third big finding uh, is the ways in which Latinos view a number of issues. So for example, the issue of abortion. More Latinos, for example, than, uh, than not say that abortion should be legal in all or most cases. Um, also on the issue of uh, capitalism versus socialism, we find that Latinos are more likely to say that they see capitalism positively than they do socialism, though that varies by origin group and age groups. But those are just the three big key findings from this particular uh, report. There's more even about the election. We, we can talk about that, about how Latinos might vote and how they see Biden and Trump. But I think that those are the three big findings. Well, thank you very much. This is a very interesting report. If you'd like to see it, it is in the chat. You can uh, go look at it. It's, it's one of the most informative reports, Latino voters, that I've seen. Um, and it goes into depth, which is appreciated. As you mentioned, there's been a big debate about uh, the uh, Republicans uh, hoping for a realignment among Latino voters, uh, the 2020 election, particularly in Florida and parts of Texas um, and elsewhere, seem to provide some evidence of that, or at least um, hints of that. Um, and then, you, you, you know, you look at who the Latino voters are, they tend to look at look like the working class voters that 
Donald Trump and Republicans have been doing better with than Democrats. Is that is that a kind of a, a signal that yes, there's you know perhaps two thirds or so of Latino voters who align uh, with the Democrats today, but that there could well be an erosion of that um, as Latinos sort themselves uh, towards the Republican Party. There could be an erosion, and I think a lot depends on the candidates and the policies of future in the future, um, and even not that far into the future. Uh, but this last election, 2020, um, in some ways was a return to the past. Um, if you look in 2004, for example, then President George Bush in his reelection campaign won 40% or more of Latino voter support. And if you look even farther back to Ronald Reagan's years in the 1980s, 1984, uh, Ronald Reagan, according to exit polls, then won about 35% of Latino voter support. Where was Trump in 2020? Well, our verified voter study from the Pew Research Center, and I want to stress this is a verified voter study, not an exit poll, but we went back to our panelists' voting records to see who they voted for. We found that 38% of Latino voters who cast a vote in 2020 um, uh, supported Donald Trump. That was up from where he was in 2016, according to our verified voter study, which in 2016 was at 28% or so. This isn't all that different than what we've seen from other candidates in the past. And so uh, I, it's interesting to hear the conversation about Latino voters, whether or not this is a complete realignment. But I kind of want to stress that we've been here before. Where we go, it remains to be seen. Now, you, you highlighted a couple of interesting components of the Latino population that folks have focused on when they talk about this shift towards Trump. And certainly there is a geography to this shift. There are stronger shifts in some parts of the country than others. Let's talk about the most obvious uh, example. That's South Florida. In South Florida, folks always say, oh, yeah, well, Cubans are in South Florida. They, they, they vote Republican. They always have. And, yeah, that's generally true. Um, and it seems like this swung back towards supporting Republican candidates in the two elections in which Trump was a candidate. Um, however, there's more to the story in South Florida than just that. The shift towards Trump nationally cannot be explained alone by, let alone Trump, nor Hispanics in South Florida. But you also have the story of Venezuelans, you have the story of Colombians, you have the story of Nicaraguans and Dominicans, all in South Florida, which contributed to some of the gains that Trump made there compared to 2016. In South Texas, it's a different story. So South Texas is largely Mexican, Mexican-American. Uh, many people who live along the border also may work for, for example, the Border Patrol, um, but they're folks who are on the forefront of what's happening at the U.S.-Mexico border between uh, the two countries in Texas. That's been the focal point of a lot of unauthorized immigration. Asylum people are seeking asylum in the last uh, two to three years during the pandemic. So here is a different population, one that perhaps is more, as you said, working class uh, and also has a different perspective. Um, this is one where this seems like there was a, a shift that was perhaps new and also different than in South Florida. We could go on. There's other places as well. Think about uh, third generation Mexican Americans across the country. Some people talked about the role of machismo in men and uh, their their belief that uh, perhaps uh, Donald Trump appealed to that machismo. So men, Hispanic men tended to support Trump more. Maybe there's some evidence, but there's also evidence that Hispanic women also turned towards Trump uh, to some extent. So as you can see, there's a rich story here that has so many components that no one place, group, or thing can explain the shift towards Trump in 2020 versus 2016. You pointing to factors that may um, forecast that the Republican Party may continue to uh, erode the Democrats' advantage. I mean, all the things you've just pointed to mm -hmm. seem to be indicators of um, possible uh, Republican pickups. Exactly, because where are we seeing the growth? Um, uh, Venezuelans, while many of them are not eligible to vote, that has been the fastest growing origin group over the last decade in the United States. And many say Venezuelans and their, and, and their situation looks a lot like that of Cubans when they arrived in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So we'll see where that, we'll see what happens with Venezuelans into the future. And then when we talk about the third generation or the U.S. born Latino who's working class, that is also a group that's growing fast. And uh, that's where most of the growth is these days is in that third generation Hispanic population. That is 
people born here of US born parents. So they're farther removed from the immigrant experience. So you're right that these are two places where we might see if things stay the same gains for Republicans just because the numbers and proportions will grow. There seems to be an assumption among progressives and some Democrats that the Republican anti-immigrant, anti-illegal immigration hmm. um, position is going to kind of naturally turn off Hispanic voters. But what you're talking about identify a whole set of quite distinct experiences that might counteract that, actually, where you might find, and I think your poll uh, suggests this, that there is receptivity to the opposition of Republicans to illegal immigration. Is that, is that fair? That is fair. And that's something that uh, we've seen even before Donald Trump uh, became a presidential candidate. We've been following public opinion among Latinos since, uh, well, since uh, the early 2000s. And it, immigration has never been a top issue in all of our polling over the years. And even when you ask specifically about should undocumented immigrants who are in the country illegally be deported? Well, not a majority of Latinos will say yes. You'll find that a significant share do, 15%. Last time we did this way back, and I want to say it was back in 2012 or so. But the point being is that uh, we have seen a, a, very, a variety of attitudes and a diversity of attitudes towards immigrants. And some of our focus groups, we would also hear things like, for example, talking to Dominicans in the midst of Donald Trump's comments about Mexicans being rapists and, uh, and being criminals. Um, you'll find uh, we found many Dominicans would say that's really bad what he said, but uh, I'm not Mexican. Uh, again, highlighting the diversity of the population. And Larry, I'm not sure if you've noticed, but I'm saying uh, population as opposed to community, and I'm saying voters as opposed to the Latino vote to highlight these differences that exist within this population or this group. Your survey pointed to about 18% who did not respond to your question about which party's congressional candidates they would support. That 18%, of course, uh, is uh, attracting a lot of money and interest by both political parties. And I'd be kind of curious how you see that those 18% uh, breaking out. I just mentioned a, a survey done not long ago by NBC with Telemundo. And, what they found is that when you look at a group of voters they characterize as conservative Latinos, um, that there has been a change in how they end up voting. From 2012, where there was a bit of a Democratic advantage to now, in, at least in the 2020 election, over 70% said they ended up voting for a Republican. Hmm. Do you see that 18% is perhaps um, you know, tilting uh, or or even more strongly leaning towards Republicans? Um, so before I answer that, let me share the finding overall among Latino registered voters. And we asked about who, which, which candidate they were going to vote for in their local congressional election. We found that 53% said they would vote for the Democratic candidate, 28% for the Republican, and then 18% said another candidate or they weren't sure. Now, this is among registered voters. So First, the question is, are all going to turn out to vote? So it remains to be seen if they're going to turn out to vote. And in terms of the candidates that they would support, this, uh, this don't know is larger than we've seen before in other elections. Uh, although I would say there may be a mode effect. Um, we are now doing online surveys as opposed to telephone surveys. But it, it is interesting that this does seem to be a higher don't know share. So I don't know exactly how they're going to break. But it does also look like some groups of Latinos are more likely to say they don't know. Like, for example, Latinos who are unaffiliated with any religion are more likely to say they don't know who they're going to vote for. That's 21 percent, for example, um, versus, say, what you might see among uh, evangelical Protestants, where that number is more at like 17 percent. But that's still kind of at the average. So I don't know where we're going to go with those. But I do think it's an indication that Latinos are thinking about candidates in different ways than they may have before. There's a, not as strong of a, a of a leaning towards one party or the other, and Latinos may be weighing which candidate might be best. Also, I think this speaks to, at least some of these changes in recent years, speak to um, the growing realization that maybe Latino voters represent uh, a group that is a swing vote 
or a vote that might be one that's worth reaching out to and focusing more on. And if you remember over the decades, we've talked a lot about the need for Latinos to be reached out to more, that they wanna, they want candidates to reach out to them. Let's see if that happens now that Latinos seem to be a group that may be uh, less in one camp or another than, uh, than had been the case before. But I think it remains to be seen where we go uh, on these unknowns. That actually leads to my next question. Of course, we live in the era where the parties are historically polarized. Um, mm -hmm. Some of the measures suggest more polarized than at any point since the Civil War. Uh, and these are strong affiliations. Mm -hmm. They tend to drive voting, of course, but also where people live, who they marry, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, and I was struck that one of your findings is that when you ask about perceiving major differences between the parties, there are about almost 60% of the general population who say yes, but among Latinos, Latino voters, it's 45%. Yeah. What's going on there? I think Latinos uh, are not seeing much difference between the parties because the parties haven't quite reached out to Latinos in the ways that they have, say, to other groups of voters. And so Latinos, in some sense, aren't seeing a big difference because the parties don't seem to really be addressing the issues that are of interest to Latinos in some cases, or even just reaching out to Latinos. But that is one of the interesting findings here, that even the Latinos acknowledge that the Democratic Party has done more to uh, get out the vote, to reach out to them, to talk to them. In the end, Latinos are not seeing much of a difference. So that's one interpretation. Here's another, though. It is also the case that many of those Latinos who identify as Republican, by the way, oftentimes do vote for the Democratic Party candidate in their local races. And they have more of a positive view of the Democratic Party than you might see among uh, non-Latino Republicans or non-Latino Republican partisans in the, general, in the general population. This, I think, also then again reflects that in some way, while uh, Latinos may say that they don't see they're more likely to say they don't see as much of a difference between the two parties. Um, it also may be that that is a reflection of how the parties have addressed each one of these groups. And so it's interesting to me that uh, even Republican Latinos see some positives for Democrats as a party, uh, more so than other uh, uh, Republican partisans. And by the way, the same is true, uh, not, though not to the same degree, of Latino Democrats. They're more likely than other Democrats to see some positive things among uh, in the Republican Party platform. It's just remarkable. I mean, this this polarization that has swept the country seems to have um, eluded Latino voters. Um, yeah, I, I, maybe. Although I would say that um, all that aside, on specific issues, or say on review, uh, say approval rating of the president, President Biden, we see sharp divides. Latinos, Republicans versus Latino Democrats, just like we see for the general public, though sometimes not as sharp, when that usually that lack of sharpness is coming from Latino Republicans who aren't quite as in support of a policy, say like, you know, um, uh, something around gun rights or something around abortion, say as uh, non-Latino Republicans. But just to give you some numbers, you know, when you think about the uh, approval and disapproval of Joe Biden, Latino Democrats, 65% uh, on net in our survey said they approved of the job he was doing, but 92% of Latino Republicans disapproved. That is, again, uh, a, a wide band, but also represents in many ways uh, the divisions we see elsewhere in the US public. Um, fascinating. I had um, a Democrat and Republican uh, political consultants on last week, mm -hmm. and uh, we were talking about identity. Um, and um, con the conservative uh, political consultant said she hoped for a time uh, in which identity wouldn't matter and elections would be fought over ideology and policy. Um, and I noticed in your survey that you find that 60% say the Hispanic identity is very or extremely important. So do you see that day in which identity kind of fades in the background and we're all just kind of ideological animals? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know if I see that day, but what might happen is that things may evolve and change so that what we today consider 
Hispanic identity may be very different in the future, and new identities may emerge that are just as uh, that are that that are associated with just as many divisions as we see today. But you're right. When we ask Latinos how important is being Hispanic to how you see yourself today, 60 percent said yes. That's an important uh, that's important to how I see myself. Um, interestingly, those people who say that are oftentimes more likely to lean Democratic uh, towards the Democratic Party, and are oftentimes more likely to hold more um, points of view uh, that one might characterize as progressive or Democratic Party leaning points of view on a number of issues that we asked about in the survey. So yeah, it, maybe identity won't quite go away, but I'm not quite sure what identity will be in the next 20 to 30 years. That remains to be seen, I think. Yeah, that's fascinating. And of course, we're seeing the Republican Party because of strategic reasons, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, shifting their recruitment strategy. Since 2016, they have been full on recruiting women and um, uh, candidates of color, particularly Latino candidates. Um, if you look at the 30 most competitive races, um, which Cook uh, reports has done, 15 are women and um, candidates of color, with a number of them being uh, Latinos, including Myra Flores in Texas, who affiliates with Trump um, and you know, ran a campaign in which her Hispanic identity was really uh, front and center. Uh, she won the special election back during the summer. Uh, she's in a very close race right now for that seat, which had long been held by Democrats. So do you think this strategy by Republican, excuse me, this strategy by Republicans to use Latino candidates will resonate with Latino voters, even though there is this ideological divide? I think it can, because I, I, I think you'll find that um, one of the stories that's emerged over the last 10 years is uh, how much the two parties uh, reach out to uh, Latinos. And one of the ways in which the Republican Party does so, and it seems to do so, I don't know if more so than the Democratic Party, but it certainly seems like that's the general perception that the Republican Party has done more to promote Latino candidates across the country at all levels than say the Democratic Party has. Um, that could matter in the decision of some Latinos to vote for those candidates. But I, I would stress that our surveys over the years, and we don't have it in this survey, but our surveys over the years have shown that just because somebody is Latino doesn't necessarily mean that, that, uh, that Latino voters are going to support that candidate. I think the issues will matter a lot in determining how much support that candidate gets. But there's no reason to believe that, we, that there couldn't be more uh, Republican or Democratic candidates who are Latino who appeal to Latino voters in many different parts of the country, with those appeals being very different depending on, on where we are. I do think, though, it is notable that over the last, I would say that's actually not just recent, but it's actually over the last 10 plus years that Republicans have been able to identify and to elevate people like Marco Rubio, for example, uh, or, or others in, in various more local elections who are Latinos or Latinas uh, and have had success uh, in creating a, a, a group of people that at least have that level of leadership or that level of electoral experience. On the Democratic side, yes, there's some of that too, but it, uh, it hasn't quite gotten the same attention as, as you see for some of those very prominent Republican uh, folks like Marco Rubio again or Ted Cruz. And no matter what people think about them, it is interesting that there has been these folks at this level in a way that is different than with the Democratic Party. And again, I, I find so many so many Democrats and progressives who can't get their head around why uh, Latino voters who have policy views that more closely align with the Democratic Party are voting for Latino or, or, or Latinx uh, Latinx uh, candidates. Mm -hmm. They just assume that the ideology is going to drive the vote choice. And I think what you're saying and what your survey is saying is Hispanic identity matters a whole lot. Yeah, that's right. And it uh, and there's so much diversity of views among this population that it's hard to characterize it as any one thing. Uh, when it comes to pro, uh, the views of um, Latinos and aligning with progressive views, it is interesting that, yes, in some ways, Latinos do, but not always. I think it depends on the issue, uh, and it depends on where we are in the country. Uh, 
uh, those views can be very different depending on where we are. I would also say that um, I think Latino voters know where they where they stand and where they fit, um, and and uh, when it comes to particular policies. So when we talk about uh, surprise, of Latinos haven't quite voted the way some might expect. I think that assumes a lot about what Latino voters should be, and we are just not seeing that in our surveys. We're seeing a lot of diversity in our surveys among Latino voters and their points of view. So to make assumptions about a whole group being one way is very difficult. But again, I think that that's, to me, that's really, it's been interesting that this has been the lesson of the last five to six years around talking about this group, the, the realization that it is more diverse uh, than we than folks had had traditionally thought that it is can't just be explained by one top line finding, but that it is one that uh, you need to understand the nuances, differences, and stories along the lines of origin groups, along the lines of geography, along the lines of immigrant generation, and along the lines of uh, maybe a few other things like income, uh, educational attainment, but also even gender. Um, and that's I, I think that's interesting because that's the way we talk about all voters, uh, which is also just really interesting too, that we, I don't know why we would assume Latinos are just one thing, but not to knock everybody on this, but this is something that uh, it seems has been a pattern that you've seen among analysts when talking about Latino voters as a single issue immigration and a single uh, voting block. I'm not quite sure that that's necessarily the case. Um, another uh, kind of common theme has been complaints about the Democratic Party uh, the complacency towards uh, Latino voters, treating Latino voters almost as a afterthought where as a general election uh, rolls around, you know, there's a kind of wake up call that mm -hmm. it's received in the HQ, the Democratic Party, and they start pouring resources in. Um, and your survey, though, finds that 71% say the Democrats work hard for their vote. So can you help us understand what, what what the common complaint that Democrats are 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 too complacent? Mm -hmm. um, and then your survey, which is finding yeah. that Democrats are showing up, oh, is the complaint wrong? I mean, what is? I, yeah, it's a good it's a good question. You know, so when I hear this complaint, um, I do wonder if we need to think about the complaint coming from leaders within the Latino. Um, uh, population, so folks who are here in Washington who are working on policy issues. And if you think about it that way, um, in many ways, the lack of progress on, yet promised progress on immigration reform uh, is one of those areas we hear people oftentimes uh, first ask a question of me, if they're gonna ask me a question or make a comment about where the Democratic Party has fallen short for, uh, for Latinos, which is on not uh, getting immigration reform uh, done, passed, and it's been now how many how many years has it been that we've been carrying on this conversation? But that is the view of folks who are here within the Beltway and here within Washington. Nationally, um, many Latinos uh, are uh, not necessarily thinking about immigration reform, nor as aware of the insides and outsides of of what's happening around policy debates in Washington. Some are, but not everybody is. And when it comes to uh, how their candidates, local candidates perhaps are, are interacting with them. If most Latinos live in districts where there are Democrats, it might be the case that their views of Democrats are, well, oh yeah, well, my congressional representative, he's Democrat, uh, has reached out to, to me. I've talked to them and I feel like he cares about my concerns. So I do think that there's a number of ways to explain this finding. Um, but again, it only highlights the diversity of this population, that it's one that's large enough now, one in five Americans are Hispanic, uh, that when we talk about this population, the diversity of it and the different experiences, depending on where you are, can make all the difference for how we talk about the population. Response would be, if you ask that question to yeah. other subgroups, if you asked it to, let's say, white women or um, yeah. you know, Black men, uh, I mean, 71%, it's almost extraordinary. Um, yeah. Think it, about it. It's, it's not really believable. I mean... Yeah. Interesting, uh, you know, but it is one of those findings that I think has gone goes a little bit counter to what a lot of folks have been thinking about when it comes to Latino voters nationally. We started off talking about the gains that Republicans have made, but it's not that Republicans are going to totally, uh, at least at the moment, win Latino voters support at the national level. 
but they're able to win enough to make a difference in some key states or some key races. Uh, and that's where I think we are here. I think also that most folks, uh, when you ask them about questions like the party, the Democratic Party, again, they're not inside the Beltway experts, but they're folks who have personal experiences and have some knowledge of what's happening in a local area. And if Democrats are the are, are the representatives in their areas, then they may be thinking about the Democratic Party in a different way than we might be thinking about it in Washington, D.C. Great. Thank you. There's a lot of questions here. So I want to get to um, sure. start getting to them. Um, one question I think is basically uh, addressing the issue we're talking about, which is about misinformation, uh, particularly through WhatsApp. Uh, which is popular with immigrant populations yeah. um, and has been closed off from scrutiny um, from other media. Uh, the question is, do you think what's up is still an important way the Latino voters um, are getting information? And could that be one of the reasons that Republicans are doing better? So our research hasn't looked into this, um, but there's many folks who have looked into this and, and do say exactly that, that particularly in South Florida, this has been one of the avenues for which misinformation is shared across, uh, across um, uh, Latino groups. And so you oftentimes will hear, for example, stories um, about a, a Venezuelan immigrant sharing this information with uh, one of their children. Uh, but one of their children is perhaps uh, a, um, somebody who um, has been following or is aware of the misinformation campaigns that are happening out there. And you find that uh, perhaps this is the way in which that misinformation may have been shared. Um, there's also uh, misinformation uh, on Spanish language media. You probably have some of your uh, some, some of the participants here may have heard about the conversations about radio stations in South Florida that uh, uh, oftentimes are, are seen as uh, sharing misinformation with the, with the Spanish-speaking public. Um, so yes, it's an interesting question. Um, and I do think that maybe it is playing some of a role, but I think that it's only one part of a bigger story. I don't think it's the whole reason why we see this shift towards the Republican Party among Latinos in some parts of the country. I mentioned earlier that there were differences between um, the first generation uh, Latino voters um, and those who were the children of, of those um, of first um, Latinos to settle and become citizens here. And then we've got a third generation now. Could you talk a little bit about some of the differences in the attitudes and the preferences across those generations? Yeah, this is really it's a really good question because I think that this is where one of the big parts of the uh, Latino experience is really being shaped is the differences across immigrant generations. So first, let's talk about some numbers. So when you're talking about um, uh, Latino adults, about 45% will have been born in another country. So 45% of Latino adults are immigrants. Among all Latinos, by the way, down to down to all ages, you will find that one third are 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 were born in another country. Now, when you take a look at the generations, you'll find that the next largest generation is going to be the second generation, and then you've got the third generation. So the remaining half of the adult population, that's going to be maybe about 30% is going to be second generation, and then an additional 20% or so is going to be third or higher generation. Um, what's interesting is that these numbers have shifted over the years. So for example, back in the 80s, uh, more than half of adult Latinos were third or higher generation. With the arrival of so many immigrants in the 1990s and then their children being born here and now becoming U.S. adults, you find that there is uh, that the that the generations have shifted in terms of their composition of the demography of Latino adults. So I think that's the first thing to keep in mind. But what do we see? Generally speaking, you'll see, depending on the issue, you will generally see that immigrants and their children, so the U.S. born children, uh, adult U.S. born children of immigrant parents, are more likely to lean towards democratic uh, party positions on a number of issues. And third or higher generation Latinos are more likely to be, uh, or no, sorry, less likely to be leaning in the same direction. Oftentimes a majority will still support some position like say, they, they'll say abortion should be legal in all or most cases, but the degree to which they do is not the same as the so, first so or second. If I could just jump in there for a second. So that, that seems to be, um, a bit different from what we usually say. 
we usually say is that because of socialization, mm-hmm. that the, the party identification of the parents usually implants itself on the kids. Now, there are some exceptions, but that's the general generalization that's usually made. What I'm hearing you say is that among Latinos, that, that may be less the case. Uh, yes, and it may be partly because of intermarriage. Um, and so intermarriage of Latinos is a big part of the uh, story here. You'll find that among those who are third and higher generation, uh, about half have a parent that's not Hispanic. So the intermarriage rates of Latinos may also be shaping some of the politics, exactly as you just described, parental socialization mattering. But it also uh, is interesting that these are not sort of single track, but there's lots of influences coming in from many different perspectives. But uh, Larry, I would say that this focus on the generations is really where I think that one of the biggest differences that we're going to see moving forward among Latino voters is going to be by these immigrant generations. And really, the immigrant parents and their U.S. born adult children compared with third and higher generation. So when the Republicans are hoping for a realignment, um, not going to happen in 22, might not happen in 24, but their hopes may still um, be confirmed in the future because of uh, demographic shifts, because of uh, mm-hmm. folks, um, you know, kind of moving along in their um, in the history of their families, um, education levels. Um, is that going to be a factor? Because we usually see, at least in the modern era, there's been a kind of a flip where it used to be the working class vote went Democrat, the better educated went Republican, and that's eroded. Uh, we saw that very clearly in 2020 and, and a bit before that. Is that happening among Latinos as well? Uh, it is, although with the big caveat that we need to look at these uh, patterns by origin groups. So if you look at it overall, you don't quite see the same patterns that you see for the general U.S. public because many Cubans, say, and Venezuelans and uh, Peruvians are college educated, So they're, uh, but they tend to lean more Republican. So you tend to have a, a, a different effect because of these larger, because of these uh, somewhat large origin groups impacting that number for the average for those who have a college degree or higher. But what I would say here is, is that, yes, we are seeing this happen as well. Even among uh, Cuban Americans over the years, you were seeing a shift towards the Democratic Party, even though there's been a little bit of a, of a push back towards Republicans recently. It is still very different than it was, say, in the early 2000s or in the 1990s or 1980s. And that's partly because of intermarriage. That's partly because of uh, educational attainment uh, and maybe a few other factors. But it's also interesting, I think, that one must focus on this by looking at it by origin groups. And that's where you start to see that uh, Venezuelan Republicans might also be more likely to be college educated than the average Latino, yet they lean towards the Republican Party. So there's uh, those sorts of patterns to be aware of. It's fascinating. Um, there's a, a kind of say a mild pushback on uh, this discussion about Republican inroads among Latinos. Uh, Sandy Vargas asked, after the plane rides for Venezuelans from Texas to Martha Vineyard um, and other places on the East Coast, do you still believe Republican leadership will be picking up votes among Latinos? I think it remains, uh, I think it still remains to be seen. I don't know. Uh, but Sandy, that's a really great question. I will have to see how things uh, how things play out here on all of this. But it is notable that a lot of these plane rides are for Venezuelans which I think is really an interesting origin group to be the focus of these plane rides because there's not only Venezuelans who are in the in Texas who say may be candidates for some of these plane rides, but there are also folks who are from Central America. But of course, the story about Venezuelans has been one that is uh, leaning towards the Republican Party, looking like a, 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 a repeat in some ways of many of the Cuban American experiences. So is there is this a group that might be a strong Republican group in the future? Looks to be, but we'll have to see because many of those folks, of course, are ineligible, ineligible to vote. They're not U.S. citizens. Mark, how do you track um, the, the shift in partisan voting, Democrat, Republican, with shifts in turnout? Now, the general pattern is that the turnout in the midterm election dips considerably from above 50 percent 
to about a third or, or lower, depending on the competitiveness of the various races. But, you know, might a, a dip of a few points in terms of favoring Republicans over Democrats be counteracted or reinforced by changes in turnout? It could be um, because the patterns of uh, dips in turnout are sometimes uh, tied to some demographics like younger uh, younger voters versus older voters, or also uh, some other uh, dynamics within the population, such as origin groups and so forth. Let alone the locations where people live. So you ask me how do how do we handle this? This has always been something that's been been of interest to me, and we haven't quite got a handle on it because I want to. We haven't taken advantage of that panel aspect of our work to be able to capture somebody in one election versus another. I will say we are poised to do a post-election analysis, which will allow us to see how 2018 versus 2022 voters in our panel may have participated differently or shifted. So stay tuned. I think that we're going to have something on this. But I do think that, yes, the, uh, the shifts in turnout can have an impact on the break of, of Latino voter support for two different candidates in a place. And uh, because Latinos are more likely to be younger, uh, Latino voters are younger. Um, oftentimes, the uh, challenges of getting out younger voters are are perhaps more multiplied among Latinos, simply because there's so many who are under uh, under thirty. So, when you say there's fifty three percent who are supporting Democrats, according to your uh, question on uh, congressional uh, vote choice, um, that could actually change. It could be, you know, fifty five percent Republican just based on who's turning out to vote, um, you know, after the election. And we'll have to see. I'm not sure if it would shift that much, but I, we'd have to see whether or not that does happen. But yeah, I, I think it's this number that we have, this 53% uh, supporting Democrats, 28% uh, uh, Republicans, that that is uh, among registered voters asked if they were going to vote today, how would they vote? Uh, it remains to be seen who's going to turn out to vote uh, and how what those shares will be. So I think that those will shift, especially because the don't knows will then sort of filter in and be part of the have make a choice, and that too could shift some of the uh, the vote margins. For a while, there was uh, quite a bit of conversation about the gap between the eligibility of Latino voters um, uh -huh. to cast the ballot and turnout. And that gap was larger among Latino voters, particularly in Texas and some other parts of the country um, than among other ethnic groups. Has that changed? Uh, it's closed, but it still remains. And so there are still a large number of Latinos who are ineligible to vote because they're under 18. So the median age for Latinos is still uh, under 30. It's like 29 and a half. So <laughs> I can hear my sister saying she's 29 and holding. Um, so it's 29 and a half right now in terms of the median age for Latinos. Um, for white non-Hispanics, it's around 43. So that gives you some sense of how big of a difference there is. The second reason why many Latinos can't in the population can't vote is because they don't hold US citizenship. And while, the, uh, and while there have been a, a return to naturalization rates that look similar to the pre-pandemic period, Keep in mind that we had two years of pandemic period, which really put a dent in the naturalization process. Processing times got much longer, offices were closed. And so there are many people who might have naturalized in 2020 or 2021 and haven't done so. Um, so this population of Latinos who are eligible to naturalize and haven't done so is a key source for growth in the size of the Latino electorate but its ability, the ability of those folks to become citizens was dented because of the pandemic. But, but among, I, among those who are eligible, and if you were to compare turnout among eligible voters yeah. in the Latino population, the Asian population, yeah. um, the African-American population, where do Latinos, my, my sense is Latinos turn out at a lower rate. Is that true? And it's still true. And even when there's a surge in voter turnout, like there was in 2020 and 2018, still uh, they are less likely to vote than other groups. Um, that's something we see in CPS data, though I would say there's a lot of question, qu cautions around the CPS data, but our own verified voter study shows that the composition of voters is uh, less Latino than the composition of non-voters in our, in, our, uh, in our panels. And so that, uh, that's something that hasn't changed from 2018 to 2020. Why is that? 
Um, partly it's about where Latinos live. Uh, it's uh, They're not in necessarily in the presidential years in battleground states, for example. Um, half of Latinos live in two states, California and Texas, although 2020 was unique and distinct in so many ways. Um, and then um, the other reason is, of course, youth. We talked already about young voters. That's another important part of the story here. Many young Latinos are voting for the first time. In fact, oftentimes you'll find about 20% of Latino voters cast their ballot for the first time in a given election. You think about it, that's pretty high compared to what it would be for the general public. It's more like I wanna say 10% or something. It depends on the election, of course. But for Latino voters, this has oftentimes been an important uh, source of their story when it comes to voter turnout rates. Um, also, some have said that it's just that candidates don't reach out to Latinos, but we're starting to see some of that change. Could that impact the voter turnout rates for Latinos around the country this year? I'm anxious to see what we're going to be. There are many Democrats who gnash their teeth at the large number of Latinos in Texas who don't vote. And the feeling, again, among Democrats is if Latinos turn out and vote, the political identity of Texas would shift dramatically. Yeah. Um, given the strong anti-illegal um, immigration stance of the governor and legislature, why isn't that motivating Latinos to turn out? Mm. Um, it's a good question. I don't have any survey data that I can point to, but uh, when we take a look at Texas, Texas does tend to, among Latinos, be more conservative than it is among, say, Latinos in a place like, um, like California. Um, the third generation, the third and higher generation is a significant share of the population there in a way that it isn't in other parts of the country. And so even though there's a newly arrived immigrant population, there are many who are the children, U.S. born children of immigrant parents now eligible to vote among Hispanics in, in, in Texas. And by the way, I should probably say Hispanics because Hispanic is actually the preferred term, not Latino in a place like Texas, which I think tells you something about the viewpoints of that particular population. In exit polls, uh, while Latinos in Texas have tended to support presidential, Democratic presidential candidates with the majority of their support, that margin of, of victory is oftentimes not as big as it is, say, in California or in New York or in some other states. And so Texas kind of, while it leans Democrat among Latino voters, hasn't quite always been that huge win that you see in some other parts of the country. Got a question here about a uh, few tracking trends among Latinos in Minnesota. Oh, uh, we, I want to do more about Minnesota, but in Minnesota, there's maybe about 350,000 Latinos who are at least adults, U.S. citizens. And those numbers are growing. It's about 3% of Minnesota's eligible voter pool. So I think there's a lot more that I want to I want to learn about Minnesota because Minnesota, I think, represents some of the key places where change is underway and Latinos are now a large enough uh, part of the voting population to perhaps have an impact in some local and statewide races. There was actually the, the uh, Republican candidate for governor in Minnesota ran a ad in Spanish, oh. raising the issue of crime in Minneapolis. Um, do you think that'll be effective? I don't know if it'll be effective. One of the things I find always interesting about uh, candidates running ca uh, 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 ads in Spanish is you know, not everybody who's Latino speaks Spanish. Although in Minnesota, I think that the share of the due is a little bit higher because of the relatively larger immigrant share than you see in some other parts of the country. Um, but not everybody who is a Latino voter speaks Spanish. And so I'm not sure if it reached everybody. I'm sure he did it in English too, though. So You don't think it makes sense for the Democrat to turn around and, and run a, an ad in Spanish? It couldn't hurt, but it could appear as pandering. So I think one needs to be careful that it doesn't come across as um, pandering to Latinos because like, oh, hey, you all speak Spanish, right? Um, and uh, or... The worst would be to, to then couple that with something that's very, um, um, how do I say this? That would be coupled with something like a, um, a food or music. And so imagine having an event where you have Mexican food and mariachi and the candidate comes out and speaks in Spanish. Sometimes those hit right, but sometimes they don't. And if you just look at news coverage of this, you'll see there's a wide variety of reactions to the ways in which candidates have used Spanish to 
reach out to Latino voters, sometimes with very negative reactions, this is pandering, and sometimes in very positive ways, like, oh, wow, look, he understands the Latino population. So I don't know. I think it'll, I think it depends on how it comes across. It's a great advice for consultants and for all of us. Um, there's often been a uh, assumption that Latinos are Catholic mm. and therefore Latinos are going to be particularly supportive of anti-abortion mm. uh, legislation, supportive of the Supreme Court decision. How inaccurate is that? I think that there's a lot of nuance here and, uh, and there's some changes underway. So let me first talk about the big trend change. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but less than half of Latino adults now say they're Catholic. Back in 2010, two thirds said they were Catholic. So the Catholic share is in decline, sharply so among Latinos. Um, uh, what's rising? Uh, what's rising is uh, uh, Latinos who tell us they're unaffiliated or are atheists or agnostic. Um, that they make up about, I want to say, 28% uh, or so of Latino adults. Um, and then evangelical Latinos make up 15% of Latino adults and, and also 15% of Latino registered voters. Um, so when you take a look at Latino Catholics' views about abortion, we actually find that the majority say that, uh, that abortion should be legal in all or most cases. I think that that's really interesting because it's really evangelical Latinos who are the ones who are more likely to oppose it than you see among either Catholic or non-affiliated Latinos. And that's a pattern that you're seeing in our in our survey. You'll see it across a number of different issues, but on abortion, it's really interesting. Um, I think that reflects some of the changes that are underway in the population, the population uh, and the church are changing in their views on a number of things. And is that also related to the, the um the influx of younger Latino voters? It may be. I think most of the younger Latino voters are in the not affiliated or unaffiliated um, a group. But interestingly, our survey from a few years ago of the religious behaviors and habits of, of Latinos found that even among young Latinos who changed from being Catholic to non-affiliated in any way, you might find that they will say they have a shrine to the Virgin Mary in their home, or they are, or, or they have something that reflects the, both the religion, but also the culture of their origin group through some religious uh, 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 icon or some religious uh, 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 something. And so it's important, I think, to keep in mind that even though they may be unaffiliated, they're also very aware of, or maybe even have grown up as Catholic, but then as they become adults, many young Latinos step away from Catholicism. Question here, is there any research in the relationship between skin color and political tendencies among Latinos? Uh, yes, that's a great question. Um, in 2021, we released a report looking at uh, the role of skin color in the lives of Latinos. And there you could find um, some data on the political viewpoints, or at least the partisanship identities of Latinos by different skin colors. Now, first, how do we do this? We asked Latinos in our online panel to evaluate their own skin color. So it's self-reported. They were given a scale uh, from one to 10 different uh, colored hands with a white um, uh, collar, white, uh, I'm sorry, white uh, cuff. Uh, and uh, you'll find that maybe 80% of Latinos say that they are uh, in the skin color range of scale one to four. And then five to 10 being the darker skin colors are, are the next 15% or so. We found that generally speaking, darker skin Latinos are experiencing more discrimination, uh, are experiencing discrimination not only from non-Latinos, but uh, fellow Latinos as well, uh, more so than lighter skin Latinos. So there's a lot there. And we find that darker skin Latinos tend to lean more towards the Democratic Party than lighter skin Latinos. But I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but I know that it's in that report. Um, I'd encourage you to take a look at it because there's a lot of interesting findings about alternative measures of racial identity as well there. And if you're interested in knowing more about uh, the Afro-Latino population, we also have some very interesting findings about and estimates of the size of that population as well. We were talking a moment ago about abortion. Um, and I think for some people, the, the results that you and others have been producing about the receptivity among a good number of Latinos to a more liberal um, abortion policy, um, uh, you know, might be surprising. There's been a pretty significant debate among Democrats, mm -hmm. particularly Democratic consultants and critics, saying that the 
candidates are putting too much emphasis on abortion, particularly in the closing weeks of the campaigns, that economic issues matter a lot. Um, James Carville, who's famous for being impolite when it comes to um, his views about politics and the Democratic Party as a Democratic consultant, he said, um, uh, abortion is a good issue for Democrats, but if you just sit there and the Republicans are pummeling you on crime and pummeling you on cost of living, you've got to be more aggressive than just yelling abortion every other word. Is that true for uh, Latino voters as well? Well, uh, abortion is an issue that's risen as importance in determining how Latinos are going to vote in this election, according to our survey. 57% uh, say it's an issue among registered voters to determining their vote this year. But the economy continues to be number one. 80% said the economy is the top issue for them in determining how they're going to vote this year. And rising prices have been on the mind of Latinos as well. And other surveys we've done at the center, the uh, rising, rising prices of gasoline and of food, for example, have uh, been on the minds of Latinos and have been arising as an issue for them as well. So again, I think that we were talking earlier about immigration. And when you talk to Latinos, it's not just one issue that, that motivates uh, uh, Latino voters to vote, but it's many different issues. And here as well, I think uh, you, you can't ignore the impact of economic, some of the economic um, challenges that the country is facing and the impact it has on Latinos, because Latinos are saying that that's the number one issue in determining how they're gonna vote this year. In many ways, not much different from the past, but also striking given that unemployment rates for Latinos are at historic lows, uh, which is also striking. Uh, we've recovered all the job losses from the pandemic as a nation, but also particularly among Latinos. So. There are some interesting challenges here around telling a story about the impact of economics and inflation on Latinos, and it's one of many issues that they're concerned about. Yeah, it's interesting, though, as we talk about Latino voters, that the similarities in some areas with regards to the general electorate, mm -hmm. um, the impact and significance of economic issues, inflation, um, Joe Biden's approval rating, mm -hmm. um, was crime also part of that list? Would you say crime yes. is similarly important to, to Latino voters? Yes, it is. Uh, it is It is a, a similarly important. Crime and violence is also uh, an important issue for Latinos in determining their vote this year, though our survey shows that it doesn't quite rate like the economy. The economy continues to be uh, tops. But I'd also say what's interesting in the survey is uh, Latinos' views of the importance of an issue as the issue of race and racial bias. Um, and here we find Latinos are somewhat mixed in their views. Um, that survey we talked about on skin color had a very interesting finding. Um, half of Latinos think that too much attention has been paid to the race and racial issues of black people in the United States. Uh, but they also feel that not enough attention has been paid to the race and racial issues associated with Latino people in the United States. So the, there's a sense of wanting more attention on the challenges that Latinos are facing around race and ethnicity, um, and that the attention has been too focused on one group and not on Latinos. Also, uh, while most Latinos say that uh, people uh, uh, don't necessarily see, oh, I'm sorry, people are, um, uh, when it comes to racial bias, there really is something there when somebody points it out, as opposed to saying that there is a problem with racial bias when there really isn't. Um, it's still notable that about a third of Latinos think that many Americans say that, uh, point out that there's a problem with race or racism, are pointing out something that's not really there. So mixed views among Latinos about the importance of race and racial issues in the United States as well. Um, I wanted to ask you about this. I think we've talked about this in the past. There are different terms that are used to oh, yeah. describe Spanish-speaking uh, Americans. Uh, just today, we've used the phrase Hispanic, Latino, Latinx, and um, Latina. Any advice on which uh, you'd recommend? Um, and, how, so and, how, and how Spanish speaking Americans feel about them? Yeah, oh, it's, it's, this, is a, this is a great question. This is one that is a whole conversation in its own. Um, so a couple of thoughts. Um, first, uh, in our most recent survey, the survey we're talking about, we do have a new read on which term the population prefers to describe itself. We find that Hispanic is by far preferred over Latino, uh, which is preferred by far over Latinx. So Latinx, only 3% of Latino adults say they prefer to use that term to describe the population generally. 
So if you just go on that alone, Hispanic should be the preferred term. I find though, when working with somebody directly or talking to somebody directly, that you oftentimes want to, want to let them reveal to you which term they want to use. And that's the term that you should use to refer to them. So sometimes people will be very forward about it and tell you. Other times they won't, and maybe you won't even find out. I find one needs to also be respectful when one asks uh, what term you want to use. Now, in terms of the terms that are out there, I think that uh, Hispanic um, is one that's used in some parts of the country more than others. I'd mentioned Texas earlier. That's also the case in some other parts uh, and with some other origin groups like Cubans, you might hear uh, Hispanic used more often. Uh, but when it comes to terms like, uh, like Latinx, this is a term that oftentimes sparks a lot of reaction from particularly um, uh, older Latinos, but also Spanish speaking Latinos or immigrant Latinos. I don't think that the, the group has quite come to a settled agreement about Latinx just yet, uh, but Latinx can be um, uh, can spark a lot of uh, sharp conversation. You should know that there's a new term that's emerged, uh, which is Latine, which is what's being used in Latin America as the alternative to Latinx to be gender neutral in the language. So rather than putting an X, you put an E. Now, why do you do that? It's hard to pronounce X in Spanish. And so uh, Latin X, how you pronounce that in Spanish is hard. But if you put an E there, it's Latine. And you can also conjugate it. You could put ES, uh, so Latines, and uh, uh, Latinen uh, to capture all the different conjugations you might have. And that is what's emerging in Latin America. Interestingly, though, uh, the uh, city of Buenos Aires just banned. Uh, the use of gender neutral terms like Latinx and Latina in public schools and the Royal Academy in Spain, which sort of maintains the, you know, the standards around the Spanish language, or at least, you know, it says, here's how we're going to, here's the words we use to describe different things, has said that uh, the Latinx and Latina are not terms that, uh, that they're going to be using. They haven't, they haven't banned them or anything like that, but it is interesting that there is some interesting reactions in Latin America and elsewhere around these terms. But Latine is turning out to be the alternative. I'm hearing it more and more uh, from celebrities and, uh, and folks who uh, are aware of uh, what's happening in Latin America. Hey folks, you heard it here from Mark Hugo Lopez. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Every time we talk, I learn a lot. Um, and so we appreciate it. I want to give folks just a quick shout out about some upcoming events uh, now that we're running out of time here. Um, on October 19th, we've got a terrific program on the rejection of mail ballot policies. Uh, this is going to be a big issue in close elections uh, coming up uh, after Election Day. Judd Choate, who's the Director of Elections of Colorado, will be with us, along with Mark Meredith. University of, of Pennsylvania political scientists and Harvard's uh, election researcher, Tova Wang. That is an important program. October 24th, we're gonna be talking about Minnesota state elections uh, with the lead political report, the Star Tribune, Rihanna Bierschbach, along with my colleague, Professor Catherine Pearson. That's October 24th. That program will be in person and will be available online uh, whereas the, the previous program will only be available online. November 2nd, very excited to welcome Krista Tibbet, who is the host of On Being. Um, and she's a kind of a major star if you don't know her already. She's going to be talking with author and journalist Amanda Ripley about her provocative book, High Conflict. Uh, if you can think of a book that characterizes today, High Conflict might be it. Very much looking forward to that. Um, now, in terms of today's program, it will be available in a day or two um, online. Uh, you can get it as a podcast or um, as a uh, YouTube. So look for that um, and please share it. And then I just want to let you know if you like this program, you'd like to support it, it's, um, you can do that. Here's some information to, uh, to do that. I want to close, though, with a very warm thank you to our, our guest, Mark Lopez. Thank you for your time and your wisdom. Uh, thank you, Larry. It was really great. And thank you, everybody, for the great questions.